Our Bible word is Matthew 7, verses 28 to 29. And so it was, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. So this is after the first discourse in Matthew's Gospel. And Matthew brings attention to Jesus being this profound teacher. His teaching has an amazing impact on people because he teaches with authority. He teaches with wisdom. He teaches in a new way. It's not just rehashing of old things, etc. He brings things across and he has an impact as an impact on people. And this video we will focus in terms of Matthew's aim to bring across this impact of Jesus and his wonderful teaching. And the context of Matthew here is after 70 AD. It's after the temple was destroyed. And the two main issues that we will look at in this video is who are the teachers of Israel? And also the question of persecution that the early church faced because this was a time when Matthew's church so to speak or their community probably maybe in, in Syria in Antioch who knows or North Galilee wherever they were established they came into conflict with the community or the other leaders of the Jewish people at the time in terms of who are the teachers of Israel and they experienced opposition in the synagogue etc and they people want to kick them out and they were beaten etc so remember the temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD so the traditional leadership structure the priests and the high priests they were not there anymore sacrifices in the temple were not there anymore so now the question of who's leading the Jewish people became a primary issue so Matthew's Christian community clashed with the Pharisees and the scribes, etc., in terms of this position. So it's on the one hand, there was the church, and that of course was based on the teaching of Jesus, also his apostles, in terms of how to interpret the law. And after the time of the apostles, when the gospel was written, we're speaking of about maybe the 80s or 90s AD, it's the Christian scribes. Who saw themselves now as continuing in the line of the apostles and also interpreting the law or the spirit of the law the way Jesus interpreted the law and their opponents were the Pharisaic or the rabbinic movement at the time it was still at the early stages and this group also consisted of the Pharisees they had their own scribes they would have had been also their own sages maybe also some priests were there but these were the two main groups. So the question now is, whose interpretation of the law must you follow? And the law, or this Jewish law, is also referred to as halacha. And halacha refers to the way, or the way of walking. And it concerns the practical application of the 613 commandments that is found in the Old Testament. Because... People, there's new situations in terms of how do you interpret the law, how do you apply the law. So the halacha is a combination of the Torah, those 613 commandments, as well as the oral law, the oral law of the Pharisees, the sages, etc. that grew up alongside the Torah. Eventually it came together in the, what's known as the Mishnah, and the, the Mishnah came together at the 200 AD, the Talmud, was a commentary on the Mishnah that also came later and those things combined constitutes what is known as halacha in other words the way of walking how you must practically apply the law for example the Sabbath says you're not supposed to do work so the question is can I put on a light switch is that work can I drive in my car to the synagogue is that work so similar questions were also asked back then in terms of clarification. What's work really? What can I do and what cannot I do? And the, the oral law at that time was brought together in what's known as the Mishnah. 
So you can see it's a thick book. The oral law in terms of ex expanding on the law of, of the Old Testament and explaining, this is what it means. For example, let's say you must not work on the Sabbath. So to, not to work on the Sabbath, what does that mean? And if we go to the Mishnah, the following things are listed as what's prohibited on the Sabbath. He who sows, plows, reaps, binds sheaves, threshes, winnows, grinds, sifts, kneads, bakes, etc. So it gives a whole long list of things that are prohibited on the Sabbath. So it's in terms of practical application of the law. And this is an oral law that came together here in the Mishnah. So whose interpretation of the law do you follow? The churches, through the apostles, Jesus first, the apostles, and those leaders that came after him? Or is it the traditional Pharisees and scribes and sages of that time? So that's the one thing, because there were these two groups, like I said. And the author of our gospel, Matthew, he was probably a scribe himself, but he was a Christian scribe. If we go to chapter 13, verses 52, there the author makes a self-reference to himself. He says, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So our author, yeah, he was also a scribe because he was also interested in the law, how to interpret the law, etc., the proper application of the law. And he says, he speaks of himself there as a scribe. So that's what scholars see. Yeah, the author, he refers to himself in a way. He's the one who brings out of his treasure house things old and new. So that's the first main thing, this main opposition between Matthew's Christian community on the one hand and the traditional Pharisees and the beginnings of the rabbinic movement that happened. Also, what's applicable here, of course, is the persecution. Because of this conflict between these two groups, Christians were expelled from the Jewish synagogues because now they were seen as a threat to the Jewish community. They brought different teaching, different application of the law, etc. And what happened, because after the destruction of the temple, the Jews came together at Yamnia, that's a city on the coast of Palestine. There was this main major rabbinic leader known as Gamaliel II. And around year 85 they came together and they made a change to what is known as the Shmone Ezre, the 18 benedictions. This was a prayer that had to be performed by devout Jews three times a day. And what concerns us specifically is is the benediction against the heretics, that, or the birchat haminim. And that's the twelfth benediction of the prayer. Originally it was aimed at heretics, the Sadducees, because they did not believe in the resurrection. But here, around 85 AD, it was modified. There's different versions of the Shmone Ezra, but here the Palestinian version at this time, it was modified to also include the Christians or followers of Jesus, and they were referred to as the Nazarenes. So there was a curse called upon heretics and it included the Nazarenes, the followers of Jesus. And this is the, what, the way it was modified around the year 85 AD. It reads, And for apostates, let there be no hope, and may the insolent kingdom be quickly uprooted in our days. And may the Nazarenes, in other words, followers of Jesus, and the heretics perish quickly, and may they be erased from the book of life. So we can see here the conflict is getting very strong between Jewish Christians and the other Jewish leaders. Because remember, they were arguing how to interpret the law. Who are the true teachers of Israel? And they wanted to get rid of the heretics, the Christians, from among their ranks. And at this time, Christian Jews, they were persecuted. They were beaten in the synagogues. For example, if we go to Matthew 10, verses 17. But be aware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. Scourge you in their synagogues. 
A similar thing is also said in other places. For example, chapter 23, verses 34, of Christians being beaten in synagogues. And people were beaten with cowhides. What would happen is a person who was said to transgress the law, they would tie his hands to a pole, they would rip his clothes from the top, and he would receive blows both on his chest and on his back. And also later in the Mishnah it's described how to do this. If we read in the Mishnah, it speaks there of the number of lashes that must be given. It's, and it's 40. Remember Apostle Paul also speaks of these beatings he received in the synagogue where he says 40 lashes minus 1. It's in other words not to go beyond the biblical prescription. It mustn't be more than 40 lashes that a person must receive. And that is written down in Deuteronomy 25 verses 2 to 3. But if you go to the Mishnah now, it specifically says there, how do they flog him? One ties his two hands on either side of a pillar, and the minister of the community grabs his clothing. If it's torn, it's torn, etc. And a strap of cowhide is in his hand, doubled and redoubled. So that's what we use to beat the poor victim. And it also says, and he hits him with a third of the stripes in front and two thirds behind. And it goes in further detail in terms of how the victim must be beaten. And also the, the number of blows, they also determined how many the victim could take. So these were the type of beatings, if that's relevant also to the time of Matthew's community, the type of beatings that Christian Jews faced in the synagogues with cowhides, especially men on their chest and also on their back. It was humiliating. It was a time of persecution for the church. So, because they brought this rival teaching of Jesus, this other interpretation of the law. But Matthew, when he writes his gospel, and, and remember this, the context is persecution. They're being chased out of the synagogue. They're being beaten in the synagogue. Their families are probably chasing them. Now, Matthew also wants to write to them, remember Jesus. Remember his authority. Because he's the new Moses. Remember, there are these major five discourses in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's Matthew's way of saying, Jesus is the new Moses. Like the five books of Moses, yeah, we also have five books, these five discourses that we have in Matthew. And those are in chapters 5 to 7, 10, 13, 18, and chapters 24 to 25. And even our text word, yeah, comes at the end of one of these big discourses. Let's go there. It says, And it, so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings. Something very similar we find at the end of every discourse. Go look at those following verses. 7 verse 28, 11 verse 1, 13 verse 53, 19 verse 1, 26 verse 1. It's a very similar thing is said there. It's Matthew's way of saying, take note here. Something special is going on. This is the end of a discourse. And it's also his way of saying, this is the new Moses. Because at the end of every discourse, it ends like that. So Matthew's saying, take note. This is the new Moses that's speaking. He's the one that speaks with authority. Because also, the Moses story is applicable to Jesus going to Egypt coming out of Egypt, etc. Jesus is the definitive interpreter of the law. So if we look at those two groups again in conflict, it's the church who gives the true interpretation of the law. Of course, it comes from Jesus, who's the new Moses. And he was a teacher with authority. If you read our Bible word, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, Take note, that's the end of the first discourse of Jesus, the new Moses. That the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The Greek actually says their scribes, because Matthew also speaks of their synagogues. You find it in various passages in Matthew's gospel. So there's their scribes their synagogues. So Matthew is by saying we have our own scribes, 
including himself. And we have also our, our own synagogues, in other words, our own gathering or assemblies, because they're kicking us out. They're persecuting us. They're flogging us. But even so, they have their authority, their Pharisees. Go read chapter 23, where, Paul, where, sorry, where Jesus lashes out at the Pharisees and scribes in their interpretation of the law. They are misleading Israel. But Matthew's Christian community is saying, we have the true interpretation of the law. It's based on Jesus' teaching, compassion, mercy, justice, etc. Those are the main things, the way the law must be interpreted. So there's their scribes, their synagogues, and we have our scribes and our synagogues. So when you read this passage, it's, remember, this conflict that exists between the Jewish Christian community, for whom Matthew was written, and the other Jewish community and the traditional leadership of Pharisees and their sages and their halacha, in other words, their law, the way they interpret the Torah and the oral tradition. But Matthew says, no, they are blind guides leading the blind. Jesus was the one with authority. And look how many people he drew, the crowds that came to him. He's saying this to his community. Remember this. Even if you are persecuted now and beaten, remember who Jesus is. It's here where we find the true halacha. In other words, the true interpretation and application of the law.